Are we live? Can you hear me? Can you see me? If you can, drop a comment in the comment section for us. Let us know where you're from. Thank you so much for joining. Today, we have such a special guest. This man, Elon has called his favorite retail investor. And there's proof on Twitter. Okay, there's proof on Twitter of this. Go to his handle at I cannot uh, underscore enough. But let me introduce my super special guest for today. We have Mr. James Stevenson. Welcome, my hey, friend. How are you doing, I'm, man? <laughs> I'm great. Thank, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Man, thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's uh it's my my pleasure to have you on. Uh, a lot of people have been looking forward to this discussion, and uh, yeah, I can't wait to just dive right in and get started. So um, maybe we'll just get started with uh, your reactions to the investor meeting. I think that's probably a good good place to start, and we'll let the conversation flow. But uh, a couple of days ago, uh, everybody sat down and uh, we've had a conversation. Uh, they saw Elon speak, and they saw a bunch of different uh, things being thrown at them. Um, thoughts. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, the, the presentation by Elon was fantastic, especially when compared to the stockholder uh, proposal uh, presentation portion of the meeting. Yeah. So <laughs> yes. I, I, I sent out a tweet asking people to uh, comment what, what their favorite thing to do is while people are reading. The results <laughs> are seldom led to when people feel they're being read to. And everyone <laughs> felt like they were being read to during that uh, portion of the proceedings. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, my, my own personal uh, pitch there is that we should uh, let all the stockholder proposals get read at a separate meeting that occurs at 6 a.m. Uh, yes. on the morning <laughs> of the, uh, the annual stockholders meeting so that we yes. can get Elon on stage faster. And yeah, <laughs> Dave Lee agrees with me. He sent out a tweet. Uh, <laughs> saying that, that at minimum we should reduce the three minutes to 30 seconds. So yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah get on that, Martin Vieca, if you're, uh, if you're watching. <laughs> he watches make, all of these. So happen. Martin, I know you're watching this. <laughs> yeah, make that happen next year. <laughs> yeah, that's so fun. Yeah, I was having a, I was live streaming the event and boy, my chat, my chat was going pretty crazy during that, uh, during that time. They were like, get this person off the, you know, get the yeah. person off the phone. Yeah, it's such a, it yeah. feels like a very antiquated way of like, it's like a legacy way of running a investor meeting. And I, I feel like Tesla would be like the perfect candidate for, um, for sort of revamping that 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 way of running a meeting, like why wouldn't you have it a, as a separate discussion? Why wouldn't you have those folks? I don't know. Prepared people can go online, read their statement, and then just everybody come prepared to the meeting. Okay, vote for one, vote for two, vote for three. Go down the list. So, yeah, I, I think yeah. those valid. That's a valid criticism. Honestly, it's a valid criticism. Yeah. yeah uh, well, I'm, I'm having a little bit of fun there, and uh, of course. I, I heard uh, Rob Mauer's uh, podcast earlier this morning, where he was encouraging uh, Tesla fans actually in attendance to be a little more polite and respectful uh, <laughs> for for future meetings. Uh, we are yeah, the booing in the background was uh, unique. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think he said, "Keep it classy. Keep it classy, yeah, folks. Yeah. Yeah. You, you stay classy, San Diego." <laughs> Uh, but yeah, yeah, it was a great uh, presentation. We got to see Elon reiterate um, some stuff we knew already, but is always mm -hmm. good to see again, like the free cash flow growth uh, charts, mm -hmm. especially in light of some of the confused bad takes we've seen from people following Tesla's most recent uh, quarterly earnings release yep. on, oh no, is Tesla going to need to raise more money? No. Well, I mean, I'm not worried if Tesla decides that they do want to raise money, but it sure doesn't seem like they need to raise money. That's that's taking it a, a step too far, especially when you observe that over the past two years, Tesla has paid down like eight billion dollars worth of long term recourse debt while building Giga Austin and Giga Berlin and expanding Giga Shanghai and maintaining their cash balance at $17 billion or more every quarter. So how did they do all of that without raising any money during that time period? Tesla hasn't raised any stock or issued any bonds during that time period. So how did they do all that? They funded right. it out of the free cash flow, right? The operating cash flows were 
more than enough to pay for all that capital and to still have money left over to pay down debt. The debt's gone now and the operating cash flows are increasing with volume. So as time goes by, we saw on, on one of those slides that uh, second half records are coming. <laughs> I forget yeah. how it was titled exactly, but it said record second half on it uh, some, some way or another. And that's what I'm expecting uh, in my forecast is, you know, all time records uh, in quarter three and quarter four. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, for it's... volume, for revenue, for earnings, all of those. Yeah, I, I, I'm on the same page as you. I think I'm wondering, do you know, because the one thing I'm trying to figure out is like, okay, so we have, we still have to this day, like, so you alluded to this, we still have people out there that are still of the mindset that Tesla is going to need to raise cash. And, and I just don't know how much more clear the story needs to be. And, and I don't, and I, and I'm trying not to be like, uh, like a jerk about this, but I don't know how much more yeah. clear the story needs to be to get to the point where these folks are, are really understanding the story here. So uh, do you ever try to place yourself in, in those people's like minds and try to figure out why they're coming to this conclusion? Or do you have any theories as to how they're coming to this? Because I think this, this is a helpful, in my opinion, I think this would be helpful for people that are looking to learn how to invest into companies, like try to analyze things from different angles. But I'm like, I'm really struggling to to see that story from their eyes without saying that they just don't know what a number is, right? So I'm curious to hear yeah. your take. My my dad would say they're getting their exercise by jumping to the wrong conclusions. Um, okay. <laughs> Elon Musk would say they are reasoning uh, by analogy rather than from first principles, which mm -hmm. is a very educated way of saying they are not paying enough attention to what's actually happening. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll elaborate on all of that by saying they're just not paying enough attention to observing how Tesla has been managing cash over the past couple of years, right? If you just examine the financial statements since the last time Tesla raised, the cash balance is maintaining uh, or, or growing uh, and there's been way more operating cash flow than capital expenditure, which is what free cash flow is. Free cash flow is operating cash flows minus capital expenditures. So that free cash flow number is what was on that chart that you saw growing from 2017 every year more than it was the year before. Mm -hmm. And that's the money left over after paying for the capital, right? That's the money out of which Tesla has been paying down long-term debt early. Tesla's long-term debt is lower now than it's been maybe ever. Um, and, and some of that debt you can't get rid of because, you know, it's short-term payables or whatever. Um, but, uh, man, Tesla has way less debt on their books than any uh, competing automaker I'm aware of. If you just compare them side by side, you can see the mountains of debt that places like uh, Ford, GM, Volkswagen have. And they are doing worse in terms of operating uh, margins. The percentage of profit that they make per dollar of revenue is worse than Tesla's. And Tesla's volume is growing. So that's putting them at a disadvantage in three ways simultaneously. They have more debt to pay down. They have less uh, operating uh, margin um, and uh, they're not growing their top line. So all, all of those things are bad news for people trying to compete against Tesla and good news for Tesla. And I think that's what's getting missed is, hey, just look at how Tesla has been managing cash and you'll see they don't need to raise. Now, maybe they'll decide they would prefer to have more cash and, and raise to do it, but it's not gonna concern me if they do. Um, and, and maybe part of this is just an effort to shame S&P and Moody's into that investment rate uh, grade uh, credit rating upgrade that's yeah. long overdue. Tesla's Altman Z score has been over 10 for three years with yeah. most of the rest of the automaker auto industry below two. Uh, so uh, Tesla's financial strength, Tesla is not going bankrupt. You will still see idiots on Twitter saying Tesla is going to go bankrupt and yeah. 
they they do not understand what they're talking about. There are few companies on earth of any kind in a stronger financial position than Tesla. Yeah, that's and that is one of the main stories that I haven't. Uh, it's again, it's just uh, you know, Elon made a comment about retail investors seem to understand the company better than than really anybody else. And and the one thing that you said there is their their financial position as a company. It's it's very hard to find others that are, are as as well positioned as Tesla, but but this has been a story that has sort of call it changed in the last two years. So like Tesla nineteen, Tesla twenty twenty was purely viewed as growth, and you could make an argument that they needed to uh, to raise capital to continue growing. But now it's completely the opposite. Well, not even the opposite. It's an additional right. You have an additional advantage there. You're still growing like crazy. But now not, you're not just self-funding, you are going to add <laughs> what's likely to be a gigantic amount of cash as you go through that growth phase. But that's still not captured. You know, it's like you almost have, and you, you tell me if I'm wrong thinking about this, or you know, obviously none of this is investment advice, obviously, I should have said that at the beginning. We're just two dudes talking, one of them has amazing hair, the other one is losing his, okay? So, uh, <laughs> but uh, the way I think about Tesla as, as a company is, it's it's both a value and a growth stock. Like it's 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 a company that is incredibly well uh, positioned, but it's still going to grow like crazy. So whatever two stocks you have in the stock market that fit those two uh, variables. So say Apple is one that is you know one could argue their innovation and their growth has stalled in a way, but they're 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 in an incredible financial position. And then you compare that to I don't know. Take your pick of any insane growth stock that exists that's not financially well positioned. Tesla happens to be both. So is is that a how do you think about that line of thinking when it comes to thinking about Tesla's um, as a company, as a stock, so on and so forth? Yeah, uh, people have been saying the growth story is over every year for a long time. Uh, if you've been watching the haters on uh, Twitter and Seeking Alpha and elsewhere for as long as I have, you know that every yeah. year they predict the top and they say Tesla will never sell any more cars than they sold this year. And every year they're proven wrong. I mean, the growth is just as, as steady as can be. You saw the uh, charts that Elon put up that he described as being one of the cleanest exponentials he's ever seen. Yeah. That S curve is still ramping up. The growth is not over. It's not even slowing down. Uh, it is maybe still speeding up at this point, and with it, the earnings, right? Uh, yep. the, the the trouble early in the S-curve is you're not at break-even volume level yet, so you need to be able to make a lot of vehicles to get profitable as an automaker, and Lucid and Fisker and uh, so, some others are discovering that it's really hard to report profits if you have very low volume because you yeah. can't lever against your fixed cost base. It's expensive to have a headquarters and to have, you know, all the salaried employees uh, you need and research and development expenses and everything. And there's a minimum number of vehicles you need to be able to produce at a decent enough gross margin to make that math work, to even break even <laughs> and, yeah. and show no profit, right? So Tesla passed that point a couple of years ago and kept flooring the accelerator, right? Yeah. So as, as the volume levels increase, Tesla has figured out other ways to make the profitability better. One of them is Model Y. Uh, profits are better on Model Y than they are on Model 3. Tesla can charge more for it, and it doesn't cost a lot more to make a Model Y than it does to cost a Model 3, uh, to, to produce a Model 3. Yep. So uh, that mix is favorable. Tesla is producing more of their cars from China now than from Fremont. It's less expensive to produce cars in China than it is to produce cars in California. So that sales mix is favorable for Tesla. It's increasing their profitability. And the more volume they do, the the higher the operating margins go. And it's world class now. The, um, the line graph that was in both the investor letter and uh, the investor meeting deck that Elon went through shows Tesla has world class operating margins. And uh, expect that to continue into the future, especially as the take rate increases on full self-driving as that software becomes more capable and better known to be um, 
useful, more people are going to buy it, uh, not just people who are buying new Teslas, but people who didn't buy it when they bought their Tesla will uh, try it out and get the upgrade uh, wireless over the air. And folks, that is pure profit when that happens, right? When yeah. somebody spends $12,000 to buy FSD on a Tesla they bought years ago, there's no variable cost or, or it's so immaterial, it's not even worth considering how small a variable cost increase is associated with that transaction. That's just $12,000 worth of profit uh, every time it happens, and it's going to happen a lot, uh, the better that software gets. So there, there's a lot of uh, earnings growth ahead for Tesla, for sure. And that's, that's what you want to see when you're talking about investing into a growth company. You want that earnings growth percentage to be high so the company can grow into their P multiple. Yeah. No, that's I agree with all those points. Real quick, I do want to give a shout out. The hair game is strong with these two, DRK says. So we're getting some props for our hairs. Thank you. The important this is the important stuff we gotta talk about here, y'all. Is what's going on here with our hairs, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, I just I find that funny. But thank you, DRK. You're very, very being very kind. Um so I'm, I'm, let me let me throw a scenario at you and see if maybe uh, I'm curious to see what the likelihood of this is. So we the, the Tesla story within the Tesla community is extremely well known. But one of the events that, that has started to unfold in, say, call it an automaker outside of Tesla. So I'll use Lucid as an example. Um, and again, I want every single automaker to succeed. But I, I have predictions as to what is likely to happen given the trajectory they're on. But Lucid is a perfect example of one of the things you talked about that is extremely uh, uh, difficult to uh, scale a car company unless you have a lot of cash reserves or you have the ability to raise cash to get to the point where you can be self-funding essentially. And Lucid, I think, has become a perfect example. Uh, I don't know if I, I remember the figures exactly, but I think they burned through like $3 billion of cash uh, in a quarter or two to try and get uh, their production ramp up, which was, I don't know if it was half of their cash reserves or a quarter, I forget the exact number, but they burned through a ridiculous amount of cash just to get going. And I'm wondering, as as these stories unfold, as you have, uh, and I think Rivian has like 20 billions of dollars of cash, I forget how much they have, but they have a lot more than Lucid, it seems. But as you have these different car companies go through this phase, and it becomes very, very obvious that the thing you just described starts to play out in the markets. Do you foresee, say, Wall Street analysts, the broader market, to start actually understanding what is happening here with Tesla? Or do you think this is a, this is a story that we uh, are just going to understand in the Tesla community? Like, because one, one of the things I'm hopeful about is that everybody will be able to see what we're seeing. You know, everybody will be able to kind of grasp the magnitude of how impressive this is, to be completely honest. I'm trying to be unbiased. Just it's a very impressive uh, story for a company to perform the way Tesla has. Do you do you think there's still going to be a gap as these uh, legacy automakers and new entrants uh, start going through that extremely painful phase of actually building an EV company? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. You know, um, I, I don't think everybody needs to get the Tesla story. Uh, the Tesla mm -hmm. co community gets the Tesla story. Um, and for Tesla to be successful, they don't need to convince everyone. <laughs> right? Of course. Of course. Uh, Tesla does not need to capture 100% uh, of the market to be extremely profitable and wildly successful. So yeah. if uh, if Tesla can convince, I don't know, 10% of the market that what they want is a Tesla for their next vehicle, uh, that's extremely powerful, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the, the flaw made on the other side of this argument is from people saying, well, we, we don't trust Elon and we don't trust Tesla and uh, we think no one else will either. So if, if nobody else uh, trusts Tesla or Elon then they're gonna go bankrupt, well, that, that that's that that's relying on something impossible to happen uh, to make your bare thesis work. Uh, it, Tesla will not be abandoned by 100% of the market, right? Uh, and on, on our side, on the bullish side of the argument, we don't require 100% of the market to support what Elon is doing or to want to buy a Tesla. A much smaller share than that will work to make Tesla by far the most profitable automaker in the world, which is the important part. 
right? Apple does not make most of the world's cell phones, but Apple does make most of the world's profit from selling cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's that's the situation you want to be in as Tesla. You want to take most of the auto market's earnings. And Tesla has a clear path laid out in front of them for how to do that with uh, software, with autonomy, uh, and with their future product pipeline. Uh, so if, uh, if those uh, humanoid robots uh, can replace a significant amount of labor uh, wow, that yeah. that'll be that'll really be something. Now, I, I don't have any of that value in my long-term uh, earnings model, and Tesla will produce plenty of earnings without any of that. Yeah. Uh, but if uh, if Elon is really onto something there, and a lot of uh, dangerous, boring, or repetitive work can be done by uh, humanoid robots instead of by people. The economics are going to be really wacky on that, yeah. right? Like if you can if you can train those robots to work, I don't know, uh, uh, a, a job on a fishing vessel or something instead of having mm -hmm. to pay people to do that work, the payback period is short on that kind of work, yeah. right? Yeah, I actually did an exercise. Um, so while I worked at Tesla, I was there for a little over four years, and I was in the service distribution. Um, part of the part of the company I was in supply chain and I was working very closely with expanding that distribution network and it really my background was analytics dashboarding KPIs things like that but the way Tesla works is like oh you know how to kind of do that go build an entire thing I'm like okay I'll try my best without dying okay <laughs> so but it's yeah. it was a great growth experience it was incredible honestly like the best four years of my mm -hmm. life but uh, I saw I, I was extremely um, I became very, very uh, aware and really understood what a warehouse job was. Right. So picking, packing, putting away for those that are not familiar. So these are folks uh, that are essentially just moving product, either with equipment or not equipment from one point of the warehouse to another. That's think of a warehouse worker of that. So they could be shipping a product or whatever. And then when the bot was announced, I'm like, OK. And, and of course, you can apply this to any sort of situation. Um, but that's one manual uh, labor that I was very, very familiar with. And I'm like, okay, if a bot comes in and I did some rough math, the utility of a bot, the way I think about it is the bot can probably work uh, as good or faster than your best employee uh, at that uh, facility, which already puts it, you know, best employees versus the average are roughly twice uh, more productive than the average employee. So you already have 2x boost there. And then the bot ain't working eight hours. It's working for pretty close to 24 right. hours, right? Yeah, so that's a six It's not taking any smoke breaks. It's not taking any meal breaks. Exactly. It's not filing any grievances against the company for- Doesn't uh, have a family. Uh, for yep. perceived unfair treatment. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, it, so it's it an X, time six to recharge. X multiplier. Yeah. Yeah, it, it needs to, to recharge batteries or, or swap out batteries. But apart from that, you've got near 100% uptime. Yep, it's pretty wild. And then you, yeah. you you take those numbers and, and that and that to your point, it's like if you get six x the amount of um, a utility out of a bot than a human. I hate to put it this way because it sounds very inhumane, but it's I'm trying to like I'm trying to separate. I'm just talking about the eco economics here. Six x yeah. uh, more efficient than a human, call it. And then uh, the the cost of materials, the cost of labor. The cost of the equipment that's going to take to build this bot, I don't know, all in might be like 25 grand, maybe 30 grand. Who knows? Who knows what the number is? But it's going to be, it's going to pay for itself in weeks, you know, or months, the, whatever that cost well, is. So, so the, the, the price ought to start high uh, because yeah. the people who need these the most ought to be willing to pay the most for them. And the market Great. should determine the price. So the, the pricing shouldn't be a multiple of the cost. Or the variable okay. cost of production, it it ought to be what every other price ought to be, which is what the market will bear. Uh, yeah. How how highly does the market perceive the product that we're producing? That ought to determine what the price is. So maybe you've got a bot that costs you uh, twenty thousand dollars variable uh, to to manufacture, and you can sell it for. A hundred thousand dollars, right? <laughs> um, you've you've got a really good business 
if you're the only people making that product, then you don't have competitors. And uh, that that could get real wacky in terms of oh, yeah. the uh, the economics. Now, we're of, of course we're speculating wildly on this topic because we don't have any specifics on this topic. So yeah. we, we kind of are forced to, but yeah, I mean, bot, bots have unfair advantages over people in some respects, not in all respects. Um, right. So maybe what's likely to, to happen is to have bots assist people or, or, or to have the, the optimists, um, uh, uh, humanoid robots assist people. So who, who would be better at pulling uh, purchase orders and packing slips and stuff? Well, the computer can be wirelessly connected to your database directly exactly, and able exactly. to grab that information instantly. But exactly. the human being is better at figuring out common sense stuff. So the world is messy and unpredictable and idiosyncratic. And human beings are really good at figuring out what's going on and yeah. doing the right thing next. So humans are great at giving orders to robots hey, yeah. here's what's going on. Skip that step. Go to the next one. This is a weird situation, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but what's uh, interesting about that common sense uh, uh, statement you just made, which which I, which I agree with you, but uh, real quick, I want to give a shout out. Uh, MC, MCGCH46E. I don't know how to pronounce that, but thank you for the $5 super sticker. Thank you very much. You're great. Um, the... Um, Common sense, so I'll use this in a work example. So for a worker to use common sense, th the way I view that is that there has been a situation at the job where a process wasn't followed or processes haven't been followed, which presents a situation for a worker to have to use common sense to solve the problem. But if we had a world where uh, all the labor and everything was done either with AI or the bots, in theory, you wouldn't even have the situations where common sense has to be applied because every process has been followed 100% of the time. So what, what I'm curious to see what the bot does over time, does it remove the variable of even needing to apply common sense because everything's done perfectly every single time? You know, it, it, you think about a job or a task, it's just a series of steps. And of course, a human has to design that. But once that human designs it, would we ever need to use common sense to execute a job? And I just, just think something I've been thinking yeah. about, but which could which could really increase the size of what the bot can do, right? I, I don't know if you have any thoughts yeah. around that, but I've been thinking about that. Yeah, quite a bit. The, the dynamic you're describing is a real one where if you've got robots doing the work instead of people, it's likely to be highly optimized and automated, um, error proof, producing a very consistent uh, end result. Uh, but we, we live in the real world where odd stuff happens, right? So people can diagnose that weird stuff quicker. So maybe your process doesn't say that we need to open boxes and inspect them. But if a box shows up that has a big rip in the cardboard, a human being will see that and go, well, we need to inspect this <laughs> and make sure yeah. that uh, it's not damaged on the inside or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. The unknown unknowns, right? We don't know what's going to happen, especially in the short term. Yeah. The the one comment you made though around, and I haven't thought about this, the the bot being valued at market price, it makes perfect sense, which means that there could be, I don't know, 90% margin, 80%, who knows what the number is, uh, to 60% right. margin on the hardware, right? So if it costs 20, 25,000 to build, and the market yeah. is willing to pay a hundred or two hundred thousand. Boy, have you built a lot of margin into that product? But then you layer in the software on top of it, right? So then yeah. it goes back to Tesla's long-term advantage. If we think about the bot again, speculation, but this also applies to the bot because they've built this thing that's going to be so game-changing, and they're experts at building things. They're not just going to make a ton of money on the software of renting this thing out or downloading i don't know like the matrix i i know how to pack a box now i know how to build yeah. this thing now right now you have two levers from a margin perspective that you're leveraging versus just a software piece which is again very analogous to the car because right now they yep. have world leading gross margins on the hardware and it's likely to go higher and then you layer in full self-driving on top of it so like we already have a model to follow to really understand 
the bot's potential profitability long term. Uh, you just opened my mind to that because I didn't think about the scenario of market pricing really dictating how much the pe people are willing to pay for the hardware of the bot. Um, so that's yet another crazy thing that could develop. But it's hard to know exactly where we're going to go. But still, yeah, yeah, it's it's about the value of the labor that's displaced by the robot. So if you've got a robot that can do a task, man up position, um, it may be in a remote location, maybe someplace that normally you would have to fly humans to in a helicopter. Uh, yeah. You have you have tremendous cost savings by just leaving the robot at that remote location to work that job three shifts a day, right? Uh, so th there are there are applications for that uh, application of labor that are extremely valuable to somebody. So why not start the pricing high and uh, and see uh, where, where the market will uh, set the price once you've reached scale production of it? Yeah, for sure. Uh, real quick, John Macri, $20 super chat. Thank you, man. You guys are being too nice. You don't have to donate. Stop it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Everybody's so kind. Thank you so much. Um, let's uh, shift gears to um, we were talking about the investor meeting a little bit. And I, I could talk about the bot the whole time. I literally <laughs> could, but I, I don't want to but because there's so much. Yeah, yeah we shouldn't. Um, at the meeting, there was a Here's what I found very interesting. So Elon has, ta has talked 20 million cars by 2030 in the past. 20 million cars, 20 million. But it was Elon. In this meeting, we had uh, Robin Delholm, the chairwoman of the company, come out and say 20 million cars by 2030. And the thing that clicked in my brain was like, okay, this isn't Elon, uh, very aggressive timeline. This is the company, what seems like, all bought yeah. into the mission of 20 million by 2030 which to me gave me the signal that this isn't hopeful or an aggressive goal by Elon is that Tesla is making this its mission to get to 2030 uh, 30 with 20 million run rate. Did that um, change your valuation model at all? Did you uh, did that comment do anything for you? I'm curious to hear. Well, it, it, I don't think it was news to anybody who's been following Tesla closely that 20 million was a target for 2030. Um, or that a hundred million cumulative would be a target ten years from now. And I don't mean to uh, break your train of thought, real quick. Sorry, James. Yeah. I'm on. I have something going on here. I'm going to step away for thirty seconds. I can still hear you, but I'm just going to go uh, blank right. on the camera. But keep going. Keep going with your train of thought. Yeah. I can hear you. Uh, I can vamp. So uh, yeah, if if you want to get a hundred million cumulative vehicles by 2032, the growth rate there is actually less than. Tesla's growth rate over the past 10 years. Tesla has been growing unit production by more than 50% over the past 10 years. And in order to make it to 100 million by 2032, uh, the, the growth rate would be less than that. I think it would be a little bit under 40% uh, was the math that I saw on the 4K podcast. Shout out to Brian. Uh, for putting that math together. So you don't have to believe insane growth percentages from here. You don't have to believe Tesla will accelerate um, the growth rate of volume production from here to get there. Uh, actually slowing down the growth a little bit will still get you to 100 million cumulative, which is only 97 million more than Tesla has produced already over the next 10 years. And if you think about it, if in the last year, or if in 2030 you're doing 20 million, then in just 2030, 2031, and 2032, you ought to be doing more than 60 million, right? So that only leaves you 40 million to make between now and 2030. Uh, I, I yeah. say only, that's a lot of vehicles. Uh, but in order to be producing 20 million in 2030, you need to be producing something close to 20 million in 2029. Right. Yeah. Uh, so if you just plot out the math, it's not as crazy as uh, as maybe it sounds. Yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. The the I literally sat down a few days ago and I did just a compound annual growth rates. Thirty three percent. If you take two million run rate by the end of 2022, you go forward to 2030 is 33 percent. The one thing I'm I'm trying to understand is 
the 20 million vehicle number, I, it's legit. Elon and Tesla have a track record of execution. And, and this is something that I think gets uh, discounted for some reason in the market because they're like, well, Elon sets big goals and sometimes he misses. I'm like, well, he just del is late, but he has hit all the big targets for the company so far, which is build a profitable electric vehicle maker, which is uh, build a mass market vehicle, which is 500,000 by 2020. These things, you know, Model Y, like these things have been hit best in class margins. All these things have become true and they're very uh, big scope um, targets for the company. So 2030 with 20 million run rate is something that I, I, I'm pretty confident the company will make happen. The one thing I'm, I'm working through is what are the what are the vehicles that are going to drive us to 20 million, right? So we know Model Y, Model 3, we'll probably get, I think Elon hinted to 4 million total, but that might be a sandbag. I'm not really sure. Uh, I don't know, Cybertruck might be another million. I'm not really sure. But um, so there has to be something that's going to get us. Uh, there has to be a new car that's going to get us to uh, 20 million. That's likely to be the majority share of the, what Tesla sells. So if that's robo taxi or more affordable car, so be it. Um, how do you think about what that new product line is going to be? Or do you think it's with the existing product line? How do you think about getting to 20 million? I think we've got a good start from where we are. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm sharing my screen with a chart that I've been tweeting out for a long time that shows just the vehicles Tesla has already announced. So Model S, Model X, of course, you know, 2012, 2015 for those. Uh, Model 3 started in 2018, Model Y a couple of years later. So Tesla is already producing Model 3s in, uh, in, in California and in China. Model Y from four factories at this point, right? Um, that's a very popular style of vehicle, uh, crossover uh, SUV. Th those are big sellers worldwide. So you add to that, um, well, the, the next one on my list here is a robo-taxi. Tesla has shown at Battery Day that they plan to build a small robo-taxi vehicle. So once you have FSD, what is the right form factor for a robo taxi to add to this fleet of Teslas that already exist and can become robo taxis with an over the air update? Well, maybe what you think is that a lot of the ride hailing demand will come from individuals. And if that's the case, then maybe you don't need more Model X size six or seven passenger vehicles. Maybe what you need is a whole lot of one or two passenger vehicles uh, to pick people up and take them where they want to go. And Tesla has also, mm -hmm. from time to time, said that they would want to do a high capacity uh, van uh, type vehicle or something. But uh, we already have Cybertruck on this list. We already have Semi on this list. Uh, those are going to be important vehicles, uh, important for the EV revolution to be able to replace every kind of vehicle that's adding significant pollution uh, from, from the automotive sector. And I don't even have the Roadster, the new Roadster on here because it would be such a small volume production vehicle. You yeah. wouldn't be able to see it on the graph. It would be right. such a little hair. Uh, okay. It wouldn't even be visible. Uh, on this chart, but um, if you if you look at this, I'm not even forecasting for Tesla to be at a run rate of two million by the end of Q4 2022. You know, a run rate of two million is five hundred thousand per quarter. So mm -hmm. it, where where do I have Tesla forecast by the end of 2024? You know, eight hundred thousand a quarter is like three point two million. The year after that, you know, maybe it's a million uh, per quarter, so maybe four million. Uh, annual run rate at the end of 2025. So there, there's a lot of growth that can happen already just from this. And then from here, this rate of growth would be slowing down <laughs> from what you right. see on, on this chart in order to get to 20 million by 2030. Yeah. Right. So it's not inconceivable, uh, d despite the, um, uh, the haters and the trolls and the short sellers you may see uh, ridiculing 100 million by 20 uh, cumulative by 2032. Uh, 
they, the doubters have been proven wrong a lot in the past, and I think they'll be proven wrong again on that claim. Uh, yeah. That's not a guarantee. And if Tesla misses it, okay, well, maybe they aim for perfection and miss and hit excellence. Maybe they only produce 90 million by 2032. Is that so bad for the world? No. Yeah. Uh, you, you set aggressive goals and, and hope to hit them. And even if you miss them by a little, you've still done a lot. Right? Yeah. Um, for sure. Aim for the aim for the stars. You still land on the moon. What's that saying, right? So you're still going places. But I think yeah. I think what's interesting about this chart, though, is that there was an announcement, and of, this is this is one of my all time favorite charts that I've ever seen on Twitter. And it looks like we have a lot of fans in the comments section as well that that really enjoy your work here. The the one comment there was two comments that were made at the investor meeting. So um, the uh, Tesla is likely to announce well. They may or may not announce a new Giga factory at the end of this year. So that was a comment that Elon made. And then that uh, he sees Giga factories in the long term producing between 1.5 to 2 million units per. Right. So, and I found that very interesting. So, this chart uh, doesn't even include those comments uh, that were made at the investor meeting, um, which again plays into the whole story of uh, Tesla has so much growth in front of it. Yet they're building more things uh, on top of that to accelerate their growth or to, uh, to at least uh, keep a 50 percent a year over year growth rate for the foreseeable future, which which would, you know, we did the math a little bit earlier, will well shoot them past the 20 million figure by 2030 if they were to keep up 50 percent from this point. Um, you have a new chart up. Let me yeah. uh, talk us through that real yeah, quick, James, if you don't mind. Tons of growth here from the, the darker gray bars or the Model Y uh, production per quarter by year. Uh, and then the, the white bars are the Model 3. So even without a lot of Model 3 growth in my forecast, uh, mm -hmm. you still get tremendous earnings growth off these Model Ys, which are more profitable to sell per vehicle, again, because you're charging you know, fifteen or twenty thousand dollars more per Model Y on average than you are for the Model Threes, but the cost per vehicle might be about the same. Um, yeah. The the newer factories are the ones that are producing the Model Ys, and they're using less robots. They're less capital intensive. That means there's less depreciation expense coming out of every vehicle. Um, they're being produced more uh, efficiently. The, the lines are running faster uh, on a per vehicle basis. So your, your labor percent uh, per, uh, per ASP is lower on these Model Ys. You're getting a lot of earnings growth potential out of growing the Model Y sales, even if the Model 3 sales don't grow by much. And the Model 3 is probably, um, probably has a lot more room to grow than this. Uh, yeah. in the world uh, market, like Cybertruck, I think could be a huge hit in the US. I don't know how many other countries the Cybertruck is going to be a huge hit in. Uh, it might surprise us and, and do well outside of North America. But I mean, yeah, uh, the, the Model Y is the cash cow for the company right now. Automotive is where the profits are coming from. Now, um, maybe the energy products will do a lot better. Maybe the um, the, the battery cell uh, economics will get a lot better, and then the storage products will do better. Maybe the solar uh, tile economics will get a lot better, and then the, the production segment will make more money. But for now, it's the automotive segment that is producing the big, big earnings for Tesla. Um, yeah, I just I, I like trying to visualize this uh, growth in different ways. This is just total total production, total deliveries here. Yeah. Yep. And pardon my formatting, because some of this stuff I have to move around depending on James. Which that's way so I'm unprofessional. It. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> so, I because Twitter doesn't play friendly with Excel, I end up having to use PowerPoint yeah. as an in betweener, and it yeah. decides that it wants to move stuff around on me. Yeah. So I have to really tweak the settings on stuff to get it to yeah. go. But I mean, look at the uh, the profitability, the adjusted EBITDA, right? 38 so that's 38 billion per quarter by the end of 2025 tremendous so 160 profit billion a year yeah i mean you look at where we were uh in q2 of 2022 and then where we're going it's it's because of the software right it's because you're charging people 
twelve thousand or more dollars, and I have the price of FSD going up from twelve thousand. I don't think that's the final price point for that product. Uh, yeah. I think the the more capable it becomes, uh, and the more well known it is as being useful, the higher the price point ought to go yeah. on it. So what's interesting is actually let me let me do you mind if I share my screen for just a few seconds? Yeah, let uh, me uh, stop sharing. Uh, actually, I can just bring mine and you don't have to stop, but that's perfect. Cool. So I, I do a much less fancy, way less educated version of what you're doing because uh, I don't have your uh, expertise or your uh, beautiful hair. So, of course, this is going to be already worse. But the uh, I do have a chart that tries to look at it. it so I like to do this because I, I'm curious to see what other people's numbers are. And then I, I like to throw it against mine to see if I'm thinking about it correctly. But I've built my, so this is sort of like a chart that I have with price targets or whatever. This is for fun. This is not investment advice. Please don't take these numbers and do anything with them. But I just find it fascinating. So 2026, I have the company at 160 billion net income uh, using my own methodology to arrive to that number, which sort of syncs up with your uh, 40 billion per quarter end of 2025. So if you like, if you just extrapolate that out. So again, like this is, the only reason why I bring this up is because um, two different people have approached a, a sort of a, a model to try and figure out how much Tesla is going to generate in a given year. And I just find it uh, interesting that in three, four years time, we're both arriving at round about the same, the same number. Now I would, you know, again, not investment advice. My, the way I approach is super crude. You approach it very, very diligently, but I just find it very curious that we're in the same neighborhood of the number which to me gives a signal, I, I consider it a signal that, hey, there is a real possibility that these sort of uh, numbers are possible for the company, which I think a lot of people, uh, especially in the Wall Street uh, uh, um, uh, analyst uh, sort of world, would disagree with because the numbers are so gigantic, you know. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to share that because I just find it fascinating that both of us are landing around the same number and we're taking very, very different approaches. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, stuff. we've got we, we've got similar uh, outcomes. And you can uh, share again if you'd like. I I stopped sharing. Yeah. Oh yeah, let me. Uh, share and while you do here. that, let me bring up this uh, super chat. Thank you so much, SLPC five pound super chat. Uh, I worry if FSD is too close to the limits of the hardware, and the only way to improve is to run many sims per decision. What if it needs ten times the speed? Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts here, James, but the way I think about it is. Um, if it does need any sort of a, a hardware improvement, this will be a computer sort of upgrade. And Tesla has made it extremely easy to upgrade the computer of a car. So uh, if they need to upgrade it, they upgrade it. You know, if it's a camera issue, that's a different story. But Tesla seems very confident to be able to solve what they need to solve with what they have. If it's a computational pow uh, problem, it's just swap the computer. It takes like, what, half an hour, not even to swap that. So I'm um, not sure if you have any thoughts there. James. I, I am way, way outside my wheelhouse when it comes to how good can FSD get, how fast. Um, I listen to stuff like Dave Lee and James Dalma talk about those topics, and I, I don't see any reason to impose artificial constraints on what Tesla can accomplish with the current hardware. Um, yeah. It doesn't seem impossible to me that they'll make the car better at uh, driving using just the hardware that exists already. Uh, I know a lot of people have different opinions on that topic, but I'm not uh, prepared to say it's impossible for Tesla to get to um, uh, a, a better than human safety driver uh, on the current hardware. Got it. Thank you for that. Uh, let me bring your uh, stream back in. All right. Ooh, oh. pretty numbers. I like yeah this. is it is what it jagged on your screen uh, um, maybe if you, it, let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger um, it looks a little it, clear it's on, clear enough yeah on my own clear screen for me. it does let okay. us know in the comments if you can see it clearly if, if not we can always zoom it in on, on your side James but for me it so, looks good at the end of 2025 you had about a five thousand dollar price target on your uh, screen and I, I have about a five thousand dollar price target on my screen so <laughs> kind of interesting that this is only one of the ways that i'm uh, uh, forecasting yeah, yeah. tesla's price target i have yeah. others so it's take your pick um i have the uh peter lynch peg equals one price target 
uh, here, which I cut off uh, at the end of 2024 mm -hmm. um, because it needs to know, but because these are based on what the following year's earnings are doing, and I don't have Got 2026 uh, values forecast. Uh, but if you just want to go with a dollar sixty nine per trading day worth of uh, stock price appreciation, that's what Stevenson indicator gives you. And even yeah. on on that basis, you would be over twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, by the end of twenty twenty five. That's the most important one for me. That's the one I follow. That's the one that I really trust. Is because you know everybody knows that this is the right way of looking at it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, students and indicator. That's that's what you want to use. <laughs> no, it is not. Did you trademark it? Technical by the analysis. way. <laughs> so uh, the the idea from uh, from at fresh jiva on Twitter, Mayor Thaker, was that I should trademark it and that I should always present it on Twitter as Stevenson and indicator TM. <laughs> so I tried to always remember to do that. Uh, he thought that it would be uh, a good way of accentuating the joke. To put a punchline on the joke by uh, by trying to trademark some dumb technical analysis support line. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, there's a question know... about the Peter Lynch. Yep. All right. So let's let's dive in here and take a look at uh, at one of these values. Okay. Oops. So you just have a fraction here. You got a numerator. You got a denominator. So uh, your numerator here is double uh, A twelve oh four, which is up a few. Let's move up the page some. So we've got a 12, uh, a trailing six month average stock price forecast uh, at that time of $2,300. How am I getting to this number? Let me move up here. Okay. So this is figuring out from the line above it, Tesla stock price based on 30 times next 12 months adjusted EBITDA. So if you feel like it's a fair way of valuing a stock price, to say that it should be worth 12 times EBITDA, then you think this is what Tesla's stock price will be worth out into the future. So, so you just have to have a forecast for where you think the stock is going to be. Uh, so that's one of the things you need if you want to make a Peter Lynch price target. Uh, and, and what Peter Lynch was saying is just, hey, the the PE ought to match the earnings growth rate. So if the earnings growth rate is 100%, then a 100 PE makes sense. If the earnings growth rate is only 20%, then a 20 PE makes sense. Mm. So what he's doing there is holding to that one to 100 ratio. So that's what you do when you set a price target that Peter Lynch would say is the maximum you ought to be comfortable paying for a stock. That's what this line is giving you. All right, so what's the other number here? It's 1242, which is this number right above here, which is the PEG ratio for the last 12 months as a percentage of the next 12 months worth of growth. So what are we doing here? We got another couple of rows up here. Sorry, this is complicated. So you've got an earnings growth rate saying, hey, what do we think the earnings are going to be in Q4 2023? Well, I'm projecting $59 worth of earnings in just Q4 of 2023. How does that compare to the same quarter a year before? Well, $32, 38 cents um, by Q4 of 2022. Uh, that's, the, uh, the, that's the next 12 months non-GAAP EPS. So you want to be forward looking when you set your uh, stock price valuations. You do not care what has happened in the past. Um, last quarter's earnings and the death of Julius Caesar are both ancient history that is water under the bridge and should not be uh, incorporated into how much you're willing to pay for a stock today. Today, the, <laughs> the earliest figures you should care about are next quarter's earnings, right? And more, more likely the next year worth of earnings and beyond is what you ought to care about when you buy a stock. Okay, so if we think that we will still be earn, uh, growing earnings by 82% year over year in the 12 months that follow Q4 of 2023, and uh, PE ratio, so this is uh, AA1204, which is up here. So there's that uh, stock price again. And W1236, yeah, which is this one. So, so it's again comparing uh, to the 
uh, next 12 months earnings from last year. Uh, that's how you get to your price target. It's just saying, hey, what, what's the most uh, Peter Lynch would be willing to pay for this stock at this time if you believe all of the forward earnings projections that I have for that um, next 12 month period in comparison to the prior 12 month period. And I realized that was probably not the clearest explanation anybody ever got on how formula works. It was super clear, honestly, it was super clear. And, and, here, and here's what's most impressive to me. And so I, I come from the uh, world of, I, my background is this, it's a lot of uh, data analytics and using Excel to try to figure out what the hell is going on. The fact that uh, James has a complicated spreadsheet, the fact that he's willing to do this live and go in and analyze every single formula that he's clicked on and very openly tell you, okay, what is this formula doing? Like if it was me, I would be shitting my pants because I'm like, oh my God, what if I made a mistake? What if I made a mistake? So the fact that you did this very calmly and very bravely, kudos to you because this is the kind of stuff that gives me nightmares, that I'm doing a live presentation of oh. an Excel spreadsheet. This is how I get to this number. And then I'm like, holy shit, I got the formula wrong. That is my uh, ultimate nightmare. But no, the, the, you. The, the, the first rule of forecasting is also the most liberating if you allow it to be. Whatever you forecast, it will be wrong. That's the rule. Oh, yeah. That's the first rule of that. forecasting. Whatever you forecast, yeah. it will be wrong. So here is a table full of wrong numbers. <laughs> <laughs> These will not happen. Yes. Right? So, so that's, yes. that's the first thing you need to know about, about this forecast is that it I isn't going to happen this way. Um, and the next thing you hope for is that it'll be close to this, right? And just that. to give you an example of what I'm talking about, if I run out to my waterfall, uh, here is, and I'll size this down a little bit so you can yeah, see actually, the chart. I'll, I'll do this. There you go. Actually, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Oops, there you go. So here, here is how I did forecasting the earnings for the most recent quarter. Um, so for Q2 of 2022, on July 3rd, I hoped that, or I hoped, I forecast that there would be two billion worth of uh, non-GAAP earnings. And what got reported was 2.6 billion worth of non-GAAP earnings. And each of these blocks in between are showing you how far off my forecast was. I didn't get a single number right. Okay, I got this number right. I got dilutive convertible debt right, that it was zero, uh, like I thought it would be. Uh, interest income was only off $7 million. Interest expense was only off $8 million. Those are small numbers. It's easy to get pretty close on them. But for every other one of these, um, like if you look at the automotive sales revenue, my my forecast was too low. Uh, so they beat mm -hmm. by $275 million, the automotive sales uh, revenue I was forecasting. But on the automotive cost of sales revenue, they missed by $256 million, meaning it was more expensive than I had forecast that it would be. So you take the net of these two, that's how much I was off by at the automotive gross margin line. Uh, less than twenty million dollars, folks. I can't do a lot better than that. <laughs> that's yeah, that's pretty spectacular. That's, about as, that, that's as close as you're going to hope to get on uh, on forecasting something that's, you know, how many how many billion dollars? <laughs> like that's, yeah. I mean, it's twenty million stellar. bucks sounds like a lot of money, but um, not we're dealing uh, with tens of billions. Yeah, let's yeah. go back and and look at how many. Real total quick, James, I want to give you a, a quick shout out here. Uh, Tessa Boomer, Mama yeah. Alexandra Mertz. I don't know if uh, if y'all are familiar with her. I remember seeing James's numbers more than a year ago and telling me, "Don't even try." That's from someone who was high level financial analyst for ten years. He is stellar. So there, you got some uh, some shout outs from uh, uh, Alexandra. Thanks, Alexandra. That's Alexandra <laughs> Mertz, who uh, you can follow on on Twitter. Uh, I feature her in my weekly uh, James's Gems of the Weeks uh, videos pretty often. She puts out <laughs> a lot of good tweets. So uh, uh, she's also one of the people making the case that uh, Tesla needs to get that long overdue uh, investment grade, credit rating yes. upgrade, and someone who knows as a former vice president of Moody's in Europe. So. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but but Real yeah, quick, we're talking uh, about sorry, many James, billions one more. of sorry. dollars. <laughs> just to, sorry, to buddy. Um, yeah. Yeah, like just real quick, uh, Bahadir, just give us give us another uh, super chat, ten dollar euro. Thank you so much, awesome Farzaf, uh, Would you buy a beer uh, for to James for me? Cheers, I got you, bro. Next time I see James, I'm going to use these ten euros to get him a real nice pint. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, sorry. And, and I will not Others. drink it because I am not a beer person. Okay, I mean, <laughs> I'll get you whatever you want. Probably find something else <laughs> I want to drink though. Yeah. Uh, 
Go yeah. Ahead. So, uh, the, so that that's kind of the idea behind what I was saying when I said a um, wh whatever you forecast, it will be wrong. That's that's the breaks. You know, Tesla comes out with numbers and they're going to be different than what you forecast. So this is just a yeah. visual representation of that. And what's this giant variance over here, restructuring another expense? This was because Tesla sold a bunch of Bitcoin. Nobody expected that to happen. How could mm. you have forecast that Tesla was going to sell 75% of their Bitcoin? You just get to yeah. find out along with everybody else when the earnings release comes out. So, for sure. Uh, that's all I wanted to, to uh, say for that point. Perfect. No, I appreciate that. Real quick, I have a question for you when it comes to your um, 2025 number. So the, the $5,000 price target, whatever um, net income you have. Actually, if you don't mind resharing your screen, because I actually I'm sure. curious. I don't know if I don't know if that's going to be on your model. But how do you think about the the impact of full self driving and any sort of like AI revenue that uh, Tesla is going to generate in that year? Uh, so I'll give an example of how I'm thinking about it. So uh, I'm so about uh, in 2025, I'm projecting for the year to do about 100 billion. 2026, about 160 billion. But the um, the percentage share of uh, that sort of net income number coming from FSD or any AI uh, sort of profit call it is roughly 20 percent. Um, how, how are you thinking about that in those years? Or, um, is that, uh, too deep of a question? I'm, I'm just curious uh, how you're thinking about that. It might be about the same. I know I have, okay. uh, an FSD revenue line here someplace. I just have way too many lines is my problem. Uh, okay. So, oh, well, I've got regulatory credits there. I've got full self-driving here. There um, so yeah, so figure almost 20 billion in Q4 yep. of 2025 against okay. total revenue of uh, 86 billion. So okay. yeah, a, a huge chunk of the automotive revenue, like got it, a, a, like nearly a third of got the it. automotive revenue, maybe 30 percent of the revenue. Uh, in it. automotive coming from just full self-driving. And that's going to be a huge portion of the value that people want when they buy Teslas in 2025. We sure hope that by then, Tesla has a very compelling self-driving product. Um, maybe it's a tier three or a tier four product, or sorry, le level three, autonomy level uh, three or four uh, by that time. And, you know, way, way more useful than the FSD product that people need to pay close attention to today and maintain uh, responsibility for the vehicle at all times. If you've got something you can really trust uh, to do all the driving for you safer than a human can by then, then it'll be worth it uh, to pay a lot of money for that uh, package by then. So I'm forecasting about double the price uh, from what we have today. So instead of 12,000, maybe it's 25,000 by Q4 of, uh, or, or by 2025, that Tesla's charging for FSD that would just be worth a lot more by then. So I know it sounds like a lot to pay 12,000 for FSD. I was lucky enough to buy it in 2018 when it was only $7,000 total for uh, the autopilot plus the FSD back when they were charging for autopilot. Um, yeah. 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 I, I, I agree with you. I think I think the the $12,000 doesn't if you fast forward to what the potential true value of that technology is going to be, it, it seems like peanuts. Um, real quick, Daniel, uh, $3 super chat. Thank you so much, man. What is Tesla energy worth per share in 2025 of the ramps? I think James, you mentioned that that's not really part of your model um, for energy. And I don't know if that's a question we can answer. But well, I, just I, to shout it I out. have to forecast energy. Uh, so okay. what, what do I have for gross margin on energy by then? So if the cost is 20 billion? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a lot of gross margin coming from the energy sector by then. I, I've been burned a lot in the past hoping for and forecasting for the energy sector to get a lot more uh, profitable as it scales. And I don't think it's the, the same 
uh, kind of profit margins that you can get from automotive. Now, maybe something fundamentally will change about that between now and then. Tesla will emphasize their most profitable energy products or something, or maybe um, maybe they'll figure out how to monetize auto better uh, at a utility scale uh, to to really uh, help make money flipping uh, energy prices by by day part, uh, monetizing the duck curve, and that would help a lot. Uh, but I, I, I don't have a lot of profit coming from the energy sector that year. I know other people do. Uh, I'm not forecasting that aggressively. Yeah, no, likewise. Was there something in the investor meeting that um, maybe gave you some uh, indication from a, say, FSD growth or profitability, profitability perspective? that makes you more or less confident about the projections you've made for full self driving's revenue or or are you um how how are you modeling that and was there something that was said recently that is helping you become more confident about it because i know that's like one of the questions in a lot of people's minds is like well he's always talking about full self driving he's always talking about full self driving i come from the angle of when elon has a, again a big target in mind it gets done it's going to be late it's going to get done so once that switch is flipped you know game over essentially but how was there anything said recently that uh, sort of helps build confidence in that number? Yeah, Elon sounds like he's um, he, he's a lot less stressed about uh, full self driving lately. Now, ten point thirteen didn't come out as quickly as he thought that it would originally. I guess we're still waiting for that in two weeks. Wink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but. But maybe that's the nature of these things is that uh, um, the more progress you make in something and the better it gets, kind of the longer the delays are between revisions on it, uh, trying to get it hammered out. So, so, so maybe the software gets a lot better, but the revisions are less frequent uh, as, as more progress gets made. I don't know. I, I didn't hear a lot during the investor meeting that changed my perception of where uh, Tesla is or how rapidly they can progress FSD. Yeah, got it. Uh, and then there was another comment that was made at the investor meeting around uh, Tesla potentially doing a share buyback at some point. And, and I found that very interesting because um, one of the uh, implications of that comment is that Tesla is going to run out of things to do <laughs> and which I, which I find fascinating right because there's two ways of thinking about it uh, one is Tesla is is they are experts at building things you know that's I think that's the best way to in my opinion think about the company and you know you don't have talked about it being a manufacturing company and an AI company but I really think about it they're just builders they're building things software hardware whatever you know they could build a freaking I don't know. They could start building restaurants. I don't freaking know what they're going to do, but they're going to build things in the future. And um, so so they they have their hands in a lot of pots. But then the implication there is, are they going to be, are they going to run out of things to do? Or are they going to do a lot of things so efficiently and they're generating so much surplus cash that they literally are projecting that they're going to run out of everything to do? How do you think about that statement? How does it impact your analysis and new product lines, so on and so forth? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, my read on it was that second one that you mentioned, that the cash okay. is going to be building up so fast that Tesla isn't going to be able to find responsible ways to deploy capital at a reasonable pace that would eat through all of it so that there would be this cash building up problem, same problem that Apple had um, mm -hmm. maybe a decade ago where the, the cash just kept stacking up, uh, what do you do with it? Well, if you pay dividends, um, then yes, investors will interpret from that that you have run out of growth ideas and growth projects and that you are in the maturity phase as a corporation uh, and that you're no longer a growth story. And if all you can think of to do with the money is to give it back to the people who own the shares, then you don't have sufficient growth capital uh, projects in, in your pipeline. So are buybacks better than dividends? Yes, they're better because dividends don't give your investors a choice as to whether they're going to pay taxes or not. 
and buybacks do. In both cases, you're returning value to the shareholder uh, in the form of dividends. It's a cash payment that everybody who owns the stock has to pay taxes on whether they would like to do that or not based on their individual circumstances. And in the case of buybacks, it's share price appreciation because the company is taking shares, is confiscating shares from whoever the investors are who believe they're worth the least. And doing that raises the price of the stock. So that when, when you do share buybacks, you're, you're taking them away from whoever is willing to part with them for the least. And that must raise the price of the stock. So if anybody wants to pay taxes on their gains, they can sell at that higher price point and, um, and, and make their gains that way from the distribution. But we wouldn't be talking about buybacks at all if Tesla were worried about their cash position. If Tesla were worried about having to go back to the market to raise money, um, there would be no conversation about share buybacks. That's what you do when you have more cash than you know what to do with, which in, in my judgment is a good place to be if uh, that's uh, what the company that's growing at this rate and growing earnings at this rate is telling you they, they see coming. Yeah, for real. I have a lot of thoughts about that, what you just said, too. Real quick, Tesla Boomer Mama, $10, super sticker. Thank you so much. James, I'm going to be buying you a lot of drinks, my friend. <laughs> We're going to be buying you a lot of drinks. I got you, man. Um, yeah, the so, so two things came to mind there. Uh, I'll ask this question first. When do you think this buyback could happen? I would not count on this happening in the next year or two. Um, so maybe maybe push it out another couple of years. Tesla has a lot of gigafactories to build. Uh, yeah. If you want to get to 20 million, uh, and if you think each of those gigafactories can produce one and a half or two million vehicles a year, you want to get to 20 million, you need, you know, at least uh, at least 10 of those. I think Elon said 12 during the investor meeting, right? Uh, yep. Now, some of those can get built at Austin. So Giga Austin has plenty of land. So they've got room to expand more. And that would be one place uh, where I, I expect Tesla to do more Gigafactory construction. And others will will get announced. Um, I think it, it it's good that Tesla already has uh, production locally in each of the major markets where uh people are buying teslas so um yeah. giga berlin is off to a good start i don't think they have as much room to grow as uh, as austin does in terms of just land uh also it, it wasn't a lot of fun navigating the um the government and regulatory environment uh trying to get giga berlin up and running with uh you know questions about water resources and other stuff. My, my theory on that one is that Tesla needs to just buy that mine that's in the uh, local area that's using up all the water and decommission it. <laughs> yeah. Say there, we've Take solved the problem for you, Germany. <laughs> this mine Real. no longer needs to, to use a million gallons of water a day. So now oh can God. we build more factories, please? Yeah, no. for real. Um, the other thing that popped to mind when you were talking about buybacks being better than dividends i agree with you 100 percent. so like literally you're taking money like you said from from weak hands essentially and you're uh putting it in the hands of literally the strongest <laughs> hand out there which is the company uh so it's yeah. you get this double whammy effect you remove weak players you add extremely strong players which is beautiful what, what i thought about the dividend and i honestly i have changed my mind on this because before i was um i was sort of the of the thought process that uh, like you said that dividend signals a certain thing to the market that uh hey we've like literally run out of things to do and and to th uh, think about or, or to work on so just here's some money like congratulations you invested correctly boom here's here's i don't know three four percent whatever whatever you want to call it but <clears throat> what's interesting about that pro that the so i'm trying to be uh sort of mindful about this and trying to be even keel but uh say 2026 2027 the, the year 2026 2027 there could be a scenario where uh fsd is uh essentially call it fully ramped and it's out there generating god knows how much cash you have uh tesla on the way of maybe manufacturing 10 to call it 12 million cars a year 
with extremely high margins. You have an, an energy uh, uh, sector or product line that hopefully is ramped by then. I don't know if it's still going to be ramped by then, but that's going to be generating a lot of cash. You have potentially the bot starting to be introduced at that market price, call it you know, 100000 per bot by then. I don't know if it's accurate, but not. Uh, Cybertruck, layer and layer and a bunch of different products. A lot of, there's a lot of cash, a lot of cash. And so of course, you could continually do share buybacks. But I'm curious about this scenario. So Elon has been, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts specifically. Uh, Elon has been very complimentary of the retail investor. Uh, he's been very complimentary of the people that have purchased Tesla. Uh, and, and he knows that there is a significant portion of his um, uh, customers that are investors. I mean, I'm, I'm really curious to see. And I think them opening up that, uh, you know, you being able to register yourself as a shareholder through the Tesla website is giving them a lot of valuable data that says this is what our percentage of customers uh, are investors. So what I'm curious is within the dividend uh, sort of framework, could there be a possibility where Tesla does decide to do a dividend maybe sooner than we think? Because they the mindset could be we've run out of ways to allocate our capital but we have a uh, investor base that uh, has seen this. Uh, they're problem solvers. They understand what's going to happen here. I wonder if the thought process could be, let's introduce a dividend because the cash that will uh, essentially uh, pass on to the investor base, they'll know what to do with that money. Have you thought about that? Is that a crazy thought? Uh, or is that too much? Am I thinking too hard about this and too crazily? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I'm not expecting Tesla to pay any dividends over the mm -hmm. near to medium term. Uh, maybe, maybe in the long term, that's something that that they move to. It just it doesn't doesn't feel like something that would be easy to talk Elon into doing. Now, it, but the the scenario you you, you laid out is, is not remote. Uh, there will be a lot of cash flowing into Tesla, and there will be a lot of earnings. So what do you do with all that cash? It's irresponsible to expand your capital um, at a faster pace than you can manage uh, because then you run into um, project risk on we, we don't have the resources to expand this fast, to hire this many people, to retain a corporate culture, um, to, to, you know, you've, you've got operational risk on uh, we, we can't manage all of these new factories that we're building at the same time, right? Uh, so, yeah, maybe your cash is building up so fast, it occurs to you that you should pay dividends. I, I, and I'm not going to sell my shares, uh, even if Tesla decides they right. are going to pay a dollar uh, share dividend uh, per quarter or something, right? Um, right. It's not going to bother me, but the message that it telegraphs to Wall Street is a different story. So I think if you ask somebody like Gary Black, hey, should Tesla start paying dividends? He's going to say, well, no, that's how you telegraph to Wall Street that your company has reached its maturity phase, that you, you can't think of any better use for cash than to just hand it back over to investors. Right, right. Got it. That's that's a fair point. Um, Y'all with your super chats, man, my goodness. <laughs> James, we're going to get you drunk. We're going to get you so I don't know if you drink, but boy, they're coming in. Uh, Curtis Biggs, $10 super, uh, super sticker, super chat. Thank you very much. Uh, Canadian Watch Monkey for two seventy nine. Thank you. Uh, current administration wants to erase Tesla. Why? Um, yeah, I, I don't I, yeah, I don't know if, if the, you have a lot of thoughts about this, James, but I think this is just well, more incompetence and uh, sort of uh, lobbyism and all that stuff at play, but curious to hear yours. <laughs> Well, uh, at the risk of getting a lot of uh, into getting myself into a lot of trouble for no good reason, you don't have to and answer things by the that way. are unwise. <laughs> uh, well, if you if you look at who the primary supporters of the uh, Biden re-election campaign are going to be, uh, on that list are unions. So people are members of unions like the United Auto Workers and. The primary use for those union dues is to go into political campaigns. So what the United Auto Workers want to get back from uh, Joe Biden and, and the Biden administration is support for what they're doing for, for their workers, right? Uh, many people do not realize that uh, unions are for-profit businesses. They are in business to make money. They want to expand. They want to grow. They want to 
uh, boost their own revenues and their own earnings. And one good way to do that is to get lobbyists in Washington to provide um, support for you as a special interest group through legislation. And uh, so what, what they want from the Biden administration is to ignore Tesla, which has no union workers, and to support uh, Ford and GM and many others who do. Yeah, that's, uh, I agree 100%. Uh, Ferdinand, thank you so much. $5 super chat, my goodness. Uh, Elon's m and comments were interesting. Any thoughts on this as accelerant to technology? Um, do you have any thoughts there, James? He didn't say a lot about mergers and acquisitions. Um, he, he did say that that would be a use for extra cash that Tesla had, but that they don't do a lot of it, that they're interested in companies that are really good at automation and that, that are really good at uh, manufacturing. And those are the core competencies that Tesla wants to accelerate and be world-class at, and they view as their competitive advantage uh, over uh, over others is the rate at which Tesla can innovate the machine that builds the machine. Right, exactly. 100% agreed there. Uh, Patrick uh, Goida, $5. Thank you so much. Shouldn't Tesla use all extra cash for building out its robotaxi fleet? 1 million robotaxis a year times 20,000 costs equals 20 billion per year in cash, high ROI and societal impact. Yep, I, I, I agree but again it's it's a problem of okay but how much can tesla do and if they're doing it extremely efficiently and they're doing everything at some point like there is a <laughs> they might be earning a lot more than they they know what to do with so even if you're layering in all these different opportunities it's going to be extremely difficult it's going to be extremely difficult if if we think that the story that's going to play out is going to play out uh, i don't know if you have anything there to add james but that's how i think about that yeah, that would be a good way to spend a lot of money in a big hurry. Uh, if you're not selling those vehicles, then you can spend a whole lot of cash uh, in, in short fashion. Um, so that, that'll work for a while. But then once you've provided enough vehicles to the market to serve as robo taxis, then you will have the opposite problem and it'll be magnified. So all of those assets will be producing ridiculous uh, cash for you, um, pr provided that you've um, uh, you've you've deployed them wisely uh, to the markets where they're in demand, and that you're managing them uh, effectively uh, in terms of providing a superior service, and um, you know maintaining that fleet appropriately. Uh, yeah, the, the, the market opportunity is large uh, going forward if the cost per mile comes way down for riders and if you have uh, the best uh, market uh, solution for that need, um, that, that could be huge money. Yeah, for sure. I, I just, I find it, talk about a good problem to have. It seems like, and I think you and I are, are both sort of arriving, uh, we're on the same page on this, that Tesla's most likely uh, problem in the next five to 10 years is that it's going to have too much damn cash and they don't know what to do with it potentially. And they're going to have to manage that. Boy, what a problem to have. <laughs> it's, it's a high class problem. Yeah. Yes. It, it, it sure beats yeah. the alternative. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Brett Tucker, $5 super chat. Thank you, man. The share buybacks will be devastating to the shorts. Yeah. I mean, I think it's 5% of the float is short right now. It's still quite large from a, uh, a dollar perspective but um yeah it's just i don't know what i don't know why you would short the company i just don't get it but listen well free you know maybe free, you just haven't people. had your face ripped off in a while and <laughs> you love right. that feeling so, yeah massachusetts <laughs> yeah that's uh yeah yeah uh, hit that bid yashu uh i believe uh you know yashu quite well james but um yeah, yeah yashu, thanks, yashu. thank you so much yeah brother uh, you're the man um we have about uh let's see about five minutes left i don't know if uh, there's any other comments y'all have in, in the uh in the chat that maybe we can answer for y'all for the last five but uh, there's one more here from david thank you david uh with the share buyback in future what would be a reasonable float count that's an interesting question um do you do you even think about it that way i'm curious like i don't know how like would 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 uh the amount of shares really matter if if Tesla's just going to be in a uh, potential perpetual future of just buying back shares um, as they see fit to try and deploy some of the 
cash in a way? Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, we're a little over a billion uh, shares at the moment. That is about to get tripled by a three for one uh, stock split on August the 25th. So uh, that'll be, you know, 3.2 billion ish. Uh, Elon needs another stock uh, compensation plan, probably, uh, because he has earned yeah. all the tranches from his 2018 plan. So probably he will want to be compensated with more shares going forward. Um, and uh, so, and, and he's not the only person who gets stock compensation from Tesla. Uh, many, many employees are eligible for it. So that'll continue to inflate the number of shares outstanding as those shares get created uh, as part of the uh, compensation expense for Tesla's labor force. So I don't know if Tesla targets uh, a number or trying to maintain some nice round number um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you just, yeah. you, you buy back with what extra cash you have, uh, according to what, what your board thinks you can handle. Yeah. There's an opportunity to get to 4.20 billion shares. Oh, here. wow. So, yeah. 4.2069 right? billion could be a good There's number. an opportunity. God, yeah. I hope they do that. <laughs> just hold it right there. Peg it. Peg it. Just, just, just peg it there. Um, on the topic of compensation package, um, have you thought about what that comp package will be tied to? Um, I, I'll give you my theory. So master plan part three is coming out hopefully in the next couple months. I have a theory that the comp package will come out in conjunction with that release because the, the comp package is going to be tied to that master plan because he's talking about, okay, how do we scale the company? Um, have you given it any thought at all? Curious to hear your thoughts. It, it'll be whatever uh, terms the board thinks are most uh, aligned with shareholder interest, I hope. So yeah. uh, those those performance awards can be built on whatever uh, milestones and goals uh, are legal and agreed upon by the board and um, Tesla's uh, external auditors and finance and legal organizations, if they all agree they are appropriate goals for a CEO to be compensated against, then they can happen. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Um, last couple minutes real quick. I want to give a couple shout outs. Uh, Alva Trade LLC, excellent speakers helping us understand Tesla. Thank you so much. I think it's uh, totally James here, but I appreciate it anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> James is doing the totally bulk personal. of the lifting. <laughs> no, no, no. No way. Uh, Daniel, uh, another super chat. Thank you. Possible retail hoarding of shares ousts institutions. I've thought about this before, but I don't know if there's, is this even a possible scenario? Do you think retails could ever, ever um, have hold more shares than institutions? I, I don't know how that would even be possible. Uh, I, I would need to understand more about what that theory is exactly. Retail is a small portion of the shares outstanding. So yeah. uh, we're, we're, we're not close to a level where retail is uh, out muscling the institutions. And of course, you know, Elon owns 20% of the company too. Right? right. That's true. Yeah. Um, okay, well, we're almost at time. I just want to use the last couple minutes to thank you, James, for coming on and spending the time with me and the community. Uh, I found this incredibly valuable. Uh, thank you for all the work you do. Uh, if you don't follow James, so James has a YouTube channel as well. Uh, so if you go search for uh, your name, I believe, right? If they search, yeah, on you search James Stevenson Tesla. I just made it myself. It's a it's a big ego project, just all about me. <laughs> so yeah, if you. If you search James Stevenson Tesla, you'll what find What YouTuber me. is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's very self-referential. No, it really is because I, I do James's Gems of the Week as a regular feature where I go through and uh, explain why I liked all the tweets that I liked that week. Um, and I am restarting a series called uh, Who's Hating Hard on Tesla Today, which I started back in 2018 and then stopped doing for four years. So I have a couple mm. of new episodes of that, and I'll have to make a, a few more soon. I think uh, Stephen Mark Ryan gave you a shout-out for that, right? He was like, please keep he making did. these. Yeah. yeah, he's encouraging me to never stop making the Who's Hating Hard on Tesla Today videos. Yes. So there, yes. There, there's those never are... going to be a shortage of people hating on Tesla. So. <laughs> Entertainment value on those is high, so I would recommend you continue doing that. Um, 
And then, of course, on Twitter, uh, which is in James Handel, uh, right below his uh, gorgeous, beautiful face, uh, at I cannot uh, underscore enough. Uh, make sure you do follow him. Incredibly uh, valuable content. Very entertaining. Super great uh, humor. I find it to be uh, just my kind of humor. And Elon's favorite retail investor. Like, why wouldn't I got to show you this? Come on. We have proof of this. Let me pull up your, your Twitter account just to show everybody that you it's factual. Kind. First up. Listen, you've you've made you've made a lot of time for me, my friend. I have to give you all the credit in the world. Here we go. It, it's Look been a this. lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've had a blast. Hey, Elon Musk, who's your favorite retail Tesla analyst? James, guys, come on. Well, this is obvious, yeah. you know. <laughs> so that that was my joke. Retweeting him, uh, explaining what his son Saxon's middle name is. Uh, but but if you uh, if you trace it through the other way, he did reply to me. There it is yes. at the bottom. There it is. You're uh, pretty great. He said you're pretty great. There it is. So I have so, a mug behind me, uh, right, right back here on the shelf. I've got two Elon Musk mugs, uh, one of which is that one, uh, that's awesome. and the other one says, uh, "Your insights over the years have been excellent." That's approximately right. You replied to me one time. That's great, man. Well, I mean, I think it just speaks to just how how valuable you are to the community. I mean, and and uh, I really do thank for all, thank you for all the work you do, honestly, because it, it for I think for every for every investor out there, it's always important to have as many different sources as possible to really test your own thesis. And I think we're very fortunate. You know, of course, you're an amazing part of the community, but there's just so many great uh, folks out there in the retail investing community for Tesla that that do really really good work. And uh, I think we've sort of uh, Tesla is almost like this magnet. I put this out on my tweet, like it's a magnet for really passionate people. And somehow we've all culminated around this mission that is very important. And it just so happens to be filled with a lot of uh, uh, really smart folks like yourself and, and, and others that really know how to uh, apply logic and uh, sort of um, first principles thinking to understand a story. And uh, yeah, man, it's it's I think there will be 10 to 20 years from now, I think there's they're going to look back and be like, wow, this is sort of a very new thing where the retail investor has really become a force to be reckoned with when it comes to understanding uh, companies and stories. And and hopefully we can propagate that to every single situation out there, right? Not just Tesla, but let's let's see how we can figure out and have a retail investing community that's as strong and as valuable as Tesla's to every single company so that all of us can make better decisions, right? So uh, maybe maybe we, we all need to sit down and figure out how to do that. But thank you so much for your time, man. Yeah. Really appreciate you having I, making the time I appreciate it. it. Yeah, the Tesla community is pretty great. And as hobbies go, there are worse ones. <laughs> yes, yes, there are much worse ones. I love that's the perfect summary. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you around on the next one. Great. Bye, folks.